<clears throat> Hello. Um, today we'll talk about uh, a very interesting uh, um, architect, an artist and designer, uh, Jona Friedman, who was born in, in 1923 and died in 2020. So he lived for a long time. So let's uh, let's read a little bit about a little bit about him. Jona Friedman, born on uh, June 5th, 1923 and died in February 2020, so three years ago, was a Hungarian-born French architect, urban planner, and designer. He was influential in the late 1950s and early 1960s, best known for his theory of mobile architecture. In, in, in essence, he was a dreamer, a utopian, uh, who externalized his uh, desire to <clears throat> improve the world or to change the world through architecture. Uh, this was the man, uh, Jona Friedman. Uh, there was a time when, when he was very published, publicized, like in, in magazines like uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. I myself have a few uh, issues with uh, uh, where he's uh, <clears throat> presented very, very copiously. An interesting man, but I, I, I think his most interesting work is actually in his own apartment in Paris. And you are going to see um, uh, pictures of it. Jona Friedman. Most people would say that his work is, is rather uh, closer to sculpture than to architecture. And, and, th and that might not be entirely untrue. It is true. Friedman describes his approach as one that believes that ideas can be more important than objects themselves. An approach that goes back 2,500 years, but is often forgotten. So again, ideas can be more important than the objects themselves. Some drawings. Uh, he was very preoccupied about a, a, a people's architecture. So, you know, he says that there are three preconditions for people's architecture. It must be easy to assemble for a layman. It has to be uh, an assemblage of inexpensive technical components. And uh, sorry, I, I, I cannot read uh, because something uh, that Sumi is so... Uh, stubborn in, in, in uh, providing me was is covering the, the text, but you can read it. So please read it yourselves on the right side at the bottom. I only see two disassemble and reassemble into a different pattern. Um, in essence, I, I would say he was against uh, uh, authoritarian architecture, you know, excessively static, and is excessively imposing. He was searching for a democratic architecture. You can create a museum without a building. It is the exhibits that make a museum and not the building. Street museum. And, and he did something like this in this sense. Now I only show drawings. He was preoccupied about all kinds of uh, utopian schemes that, uh, schemes that he proposed for uh, um, you know, uh, possible uh, developments of cities. Maybe we need again uh, utopian thinking, you know, to give us a horizon of hope. Uh, ce sont les oeuvres, again, I cannot see, and I, 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 it, it, it sickens me this fact, and I don't know what to do. There is something, uh, a message from Zoom, which is covering the, the, the text, and I have to do something. I finally was able to move. So, Musée de Rue, meaning the street museum, ce sont les oeuvres qui font le musée. Uh, we already read this. The, the, the artworks make the museum, and not the building. This is, uh, you know, his uh, point of view, his uh, his theory. But he made many drawings like this, you know, for uh, you know uh, utopian uh, urban developments. Cities in the past were compact; many people in a small area. Necessary for security, defense, enemy, enemy, keep out. 
for efficient service networks and for uh, communication by uh, uh, meeting people. I guess he is proposing a different kind of city. He was proposing a different kind of city, which was not uh, enclosed. But there are problems with this because uh, we all know the, the uh, you know the problems related to suburbia or the suburbs. Anyway, this was the spirit of the 60s and early 70s when architects indulged in the hope that they can change the world. And he was no different. But again, his most interesting work, in my opinion, is his own apartment in Paris, with which I end this uh, rather short uh, uh, presentation. But for now, I just show, you know, graphic works, representations of, of his uh, urban visions or architectural visions. Maybe seen from today, they are not so interesting <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> so engage, uh, engaging <clears throat> as he was hoping, but, uh, you know, the idea of a mobile architecture is in essence an architecture that is uh, refuses to, to, to uh, end in uh, sclerosis, in the paralysis of, uh, of uh, ex being excessively authoritarian and static and rigid. So an architecture of movement. Well, we know now what that movement means. You know, it provokes uh, pollution. It provokes, uh, you know, it amplifies the, the crisis of the, of the climate and so on. So, you know, there are problems, but at that time there was a lot of optimism. Uh, you know, architects and designers thought that they could change the world through some progressive ideas. Well, it's not so easy to do that, but you know, they, they envisioned something and uh, many architects indulge in utopian, uh, utopian dreams. You see, these studies are for Paris. Jona Friedman. And I kept saying, and I, I will keep saying it, if you don't have clients, if you don't have the public relations to bring you commissions, you can always express your desire for architecture and your contribution to, uh, you know, to society through whatever means you have at your disposal, either manual drawings or, uh, or uh, digital uh, uh, modelings and so on. It's possible. It's almost an obligation. I mean, it's also almost a responsibility. If you have something to say, say it. Here there was a form of idealism, maybe, you know, not uh, totally, um, you know, uh, justifiable in terms of economics or uh, reason or structure or whatever, but he contributed to architecture in, in, in this way. I'm not particularly fond, actually, of uh, you know some of these works, but uh, he is someone who had uh, his own vision, and uh, you know, as such, I mean, the very idea to bring art to the street, to escape the you know the rigid enclosure of the so-called classical museum, I think was a good uh, it was a good idea, you know, to to fight for the democratization of art. Here you see his proposal in front of Saint-Georges Pompidou in Paris, a home for refugees. You know, these ideas, 
are still uh, important for us because there are so many, you know, political refugees or, you know, they, they find refuge because of, um, you know, all kinds of disasters. So now let's look at the Serpentine Summer Houses 2016. Uh, are they houses? Not really, but for thinking, perhaps they are important. And even uh, they are, as I said, closer to, you know, installations or sculptures. Uh, they make you think, you know, what is a house after all? You know, Jona Friedman's summer house took the form of a modular structure that could be assembled and disassembled in different formations. The architect's statement, the proposed summer house builds upon my project for La Ville Spatiale, the spatial city, began in the late 50, 1950s. The manifesto for this project, published in 1959, was based on two pillars or, or principles. Firstly, a mobile architecture that could create an elevated city space and enable the growth of cities while restraining the use of land. Secondly, the use of modular structures to allow people to live in housing of their own design. Now, again, he was uh, someone who had the idea that uh, ideas are more important than the objects themselves. So in a certain way, what we see here is uh, the visualization of an idea and not necessarily, you know, uh, well uh, crystallized uh, objects. Jona Friedman. A man who, you know, lived well over 90 years. The Museum of Simple Technology. This is an interesting work that he built in Madras in India in 1987. The Museum of Simple Technology. I like even its name, Simple Technology. Uh, and uh, here it is. closer to being a building or, you know, a sum of pavilions. You can also see, you know, his interest in a structure that was also ornamental. I, I like the modesty of, 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 of what what it was built, you know. Why does it have to be something, you know, expensive or, uh, you know, uh, built as if forever? Uh, it's not even ecological. Here, uh, what he built uh, is uh, ephemeral and is not uh, imposing, but I think these are qualities. Oh, I can do it, for example, draw again on walls, you know, maybe invite even children who are so spontaneous to, yes, to draw on walls. Nothing wrong with it. Now we arrive at, in my opinion, maybe the most interesting work that he did is his Paris apartment. And I think he died there. He spent his, um, you know, his last years of his life. Look at this, it's, it's the most unusual apartment. And, and certainly for someone who, you know, is connected with modernity. Because here we see, uh, well, it's a bricolage, it's, a, you know, there is a variety of, I mean, there are so many things. And, uh, you know, many of them actually having to do with naive art and with the jewels even, you know, um, I find it very interesting, you know, also uh, acquisitions of oriental art, mandalas, you see fragments of, uh, he was a dreamer, obviously, you know, textiles on walls, um, 
that uh, structure above, which you know maybe was obtained from uh, some projects he tried to build. Uh, naive drawings, uh, an incredible uh, accumulation of things. You know, there is a, there is a lot of personality in his apartment, which I think is worth uh, reflecting uh, on or about. Lots of jewels there, you know, hanging from the ceiling. Again, a most unusual apartment for a modern architect. Improvisation. Yes, improvisation is important, and I think uh, um, architects should uh, should allow improvisation to uh, to be used in their own work. Ad hoc architecture, you know, or uh, like here we see it's it's some kind of a jazzistic architecture. Well, interior architecture. Okay, it's not it's not yet perhaps architecture, but it's uh, something that was employed in vernacular architecture by countless people uh, in the history of the world. And some sometimes beautiful things came into being. Recycling, recycling is also very important. So you have improvisation and you also have recycling where you, re you reuse things that came into being for a different purpose. For example, this year, the German pavilion at the Venice Biennial is exactly about this. They recycled the previous pavilion two years ago in, in, in Venice. And with those uh, materials that they employed and they, they, they refused to throw them away, they, uh, they created new, uh, you know, new usages for, for them in today's... Uh, of Venice. So recycling also, I think, is, uh, is actually immensely important in our time, which is confronted with uh, various uh, problems you now, like the climate uh, change, the climate warming, uh, you know, the wind sustainability. We need to think uh, twice about uh, throwing something to the garbage, maybe we could reuse something and certainly we can reuse paper on the other side instead of cutting down more trees and just use one side of the paper. Please, you, the students, use both sides. Don't throw it away. Turn the page upside down and draw uh, on the other side as well. Jona Friedman, look at his apartment. Well, he was a lonely man, you know, over uh, you know over ninety at the time when you know these pictures were taken. But still, very interesting. I mean, the apartment is in Paris or was in Paris. The apartment was in a Western city, the city of lights. But here is an atmosphere of, of, of Asia, of the Orient. The architect as a dreamer, why not? And his modest bed. After all, do we need, uh, you know, giant beds in order to sleep? No. Well, he was alone, but, uh, you know, there are lonely people who are much more, uh, uh, you know, expensive in the, you know, uh, usage of space and objects. And here he is, a dreamer, a thinker. A melancholy man, perhaps, a contemplative nature. He contemplates his life from, uh, you know, the, the altitude of uh, being over 90. I like him as a human being, and I, I like his apartment very much.
I don't know how he was able to, you know, find his way through so many things because I can't. But uh, obviously he arrived at some kind of wisdom to order the, uh, uh, the uncontrollable. It's a, it's a world in itself, his apartment. And here he is a film photograph because he was well known. And, you know, there were magazines and, uh, you know, journalists and critics, you know, uh, knocking at his door and interviewing him and so on. Maybe he was a kid all his life. Someone who was uh, too old to grow up, as the Americans say. And yet many books and, uh, you know, critical uh, writings or drawings, masks, textiles. The Miami project, we already saw something similar. I don't know why it's called, you know, the, the Miami project, but uh, yeah, it was done in Miami somewhere. Okay, and now we'll go uh, to the second presentation today, uh, a German architect, uh, very different uh, from uh, Jonah Friedman. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's see what uh, he has to offer us. Uh, sorry, here is a presentation about two architects, but I'm going, I am, I'm, I'm going to talk just about one of them today. Johann Konrad Schlaund, 1695-1773. So let's uh, read a little bit about him. Johann Konrad Schlaund. This was the man, an architect through and through. And let's read a little bit about him. He was a German Baroque architect. Most of whose works are in Westphalia. His earliest buildings were uncomplicated churches, but in 1719, so 300 years ago, he was appointed land surveyor of Münster by Clemens Augustus, August, Prince Bishop of Paderborn and Münster, and who encouraged him to travel first to Würzburg, Würzburg, where he gained further experience under Neumann, Neumann, a very important German architect, before visiting Italy and France in order to broaden his architectural knowledge. He designed Schloss Brühl, uh, later much changed by Neumann, Cuvier and others in a Franco-German Baroque style. And the enchanting brick Rococo hunting lodge of Clemens Wertz with a two story building at the center and a ring of eight detached pavilions, one of which contain a convent and chapel. Among his most successful palaces were the Erdrostenhof in Münster, uh, more than 250 years ago, 1749-1757, on a triangular urban site with a concave facade fronting the Cour d'honneur and with a convex garden elevation the whole on an ingenious plan with irregularly shaped rooms. The bishop's palace, called the Schloss in Münster, contained elements derived from designs by Neumann, notably the curved frontispiece and rounded corners, and made use of rose-colored brick with stone dressings. Schlau's own dwellings, the Rich House, uh, near Münster and the Schlaunhaus in Münster both employ brick, 
the former looking like a Westphalian rural farm building with a Rococo centerpiece, and the latter with a massive two-story rusticated arch in the middle. His Clemenskirche, a church in Münster, is a rotunda on a triangular site constructed on a six-pointed star of superimposed triangles, clearly influenced by Francesco Borromini's Church of Santivo in Rome. So here is uh, the man, here is the man as a statue. Uh, the architect uh, uh, became a, a statue and here is, uh, you know, uh, Another sign that he meant mattered in the in the city of Minster. Uh, he even made it on a on a stamp. Uh, the Baumeister Schlaun. Here he is with a distinctive uh, nose. I would say now uh, a church from 1724 to 1728, so almost 300 uh, years ago. A uh, rather restrained baroque towards the outside. It's not the baroque is usually known for being very exuberant with a, you know, uh, very complicated uh, formal elements. But here we see uh, towards the exterior at least the baroque is uh, subdued. Clemens Kirche, 1745-1753, another church that we read a little bit about it. This one more uh, convincingly Baroque towards the outside, but still not uh, vehement uh, Baroque aesthetics. House, Rue, Rue, uh, House, uh, 1753, 1755. I like this one very much. You know, it's uh, it, because it has a, a certain rurality, it's perfectly executed, and, and there are certain fluidity, certain curvatures, uh, quite gentle. I think it's a very fine work, this one. I don't know exactly its function, though. I should have translated uh, its name, but maybe in the name, um, the function is still not apparent. Uh, Erd uh, Rostenhof, 1755, is an urban structure, a palace, you know, moderately Baroque towards the outside. Maybe the inside is uh, more convincingly Baroque. Lotharinger's cluster, uh, again, the same architect with a not austere, because you cannot say an austere Baroque uh, building, but uh, with a moderate, uh, moderate, uh, aesthetics. Uh, another Schloss in Münster, this one quite large. Uh, German building uh, through and through, although we read that uh, his um, Baroque architecture is kind of Franco-German, but this one is uh, definitely uh, German in spirit. Another church, Dickburg Kirche and Und Loreto Capelle, church and the chapel, with a beautiful uh, tree in front. And yes, the usage of the brick, the red brick, uh, is a distinctive uh, feature. Another work in Münster, another work done with brick, and oblongs at the big window. So again, this is an architecture that was done uh, almost 300 years ago. A college, Buren, Jesuit and colleague in Buren is quite, uh, you know, I didn't want to say oppressive, but it's, it's rather stark and stern. And um, I wish I studied in a different building. Schloss Nordkirchen, another, uh, you know, it, it's, it's Schloss, it's a castle, and but uh, I see North Kirchen. I guess there was also a church built um, part of this um, rather large building. 
Schloss Augustusburg, 1725. So Mr. Schlaun, very, very different as an architect from Jona Friedman. Uh, doesn't matter, they were born, uh, you know, approximately on the same day. Uh, Clemens Werth in circle. Now here we see some touches of, uh, of the Baroque spirit, the decorations, the ornaments that are hanging on the brick walls. A very fine uh, square and uh, park surrounded by these uh, brick buildings. I think uh, this is uh, an inspired uh, urban work. I don't know exactly if he, what he did here, if he did all the buildings or only some buildings or just the square. Um, unfortunately, I do not know um, uh, German. Landhaus in Oberkassel, 1755. I would, I would say that uh, the usage of oblongs would be very, very uh, beneficial today as well, because oblongs uh, could uh, keep uh, dust and noise outside of the house, could uh, filter the light, and they could even uh, function as animators, uh, in, aesthetically speaking, for the facade. Uh, so uh, I would say that uh, a return to the oblong would be a, a good thing for a lot of buildings. Uh, Schloss back in Bottrop. Another uh, church, the, the inside of the church. I guess he did this, um, what is it, an altar? So these buildings still stand, uh, you know, after 250, almost 300 years since they were built. A castle, uh, it reminds me a little bit of the, of the house where uh, was uh, living uh, after he lost his mind, the great German poet Hölderlin. He, he lived in a tower like this one that we see here. Uh, the round uh, the round tower but it's not is this is not i mean this is not the building where Hölderlin lived other buildings he built a lot obviously he was a very successful uh, baroque architect in Münster and outside of Münster. Now look at this here. You will say, you know, this is a, a work of architecture dedicated to, you know, the highest um, positions in, uh, in the social and political life of the time. As these buildings too are, are, are quite impressive through, you know, their scale and elaboration. It happens that I like Baroque art and Baroque architecture and, uh, you know, often uh, maybe, maybe uh, from this point of view, um, uh, Robert Venturi was correct when he said less is a bore. Although it could be a, an arrogant statement, you know, because what do you do in a in a in a country which is not uh, opulent or affluent? It would be cynical to say less is a bore in a poor country. But even a poor country could could use imagination because after all, the Dogon village in Mali, you know, they they built beautifully with a with almost no money. 
So, you know, uh, having no money is no excuse for having an unimaginative architecture at all. I think you can do great architecture even with little money, if there is imagination and sensitivity. Now, is it here uh, a sculptural work by uh, Richard Serra, the North American sculptor? It's very possible. And you see the, the, uh, the dialectics between the modern minimalist uh, artwork and the Baroque building. Very much Baroque indeed. It's almost Rococo here or maybe even without almost. But the outside always is, um, is a little bit more uh, restrained, which is maybe a good thing. This is also a rather impressive uh, castle with impressive uh, roofing. Johan, Konrad Schlaun. This work in particular, uh, I find very, um, you know, very attractive, let's put it this way. Maybe because of its rurality and its, uh, you know, modest scale is not taller than the building, than the, than the trees. Maybe there is a problem when, uh, you know, human works, meaning buildings become much taller than the trees. That's it. So let's wish him happy birthday and thank you for being here today.